Hey guys, how's it going? Today I'm going to be talking about Amazon Prime's Outer Range. This is a series that was recommended to me by a few viewers who asked me to cover it, and I'm glad I finally got a chance to do that. This is a science fiction series that's set on a cattle ranch in Colorado in modern times, which is a pretty interesting setting. The cast is led by Josh Brolin, who's a pretty interesting choice. Uh, I'm a big fan of his. Um, anybody that can play Cable and Thanos in the same movie universe is pretty impressive to me. Um, I think this role, however, is probably centered more around his performance in Sicario or No Country for Old Men. So I'm pretty interested to see how uh, his performance is in a, this kind of a genre. Uh, we also have Lily Taylor, who typically is in horror movies. Um, I immediately think of 1999's The Haunting, where she played Nell. That movie was pretty impactful on me as a kid. Uh, she's also been the Conjuring franchises and a bunch of other stuff. So I have a feeling that this show is going to have quite a lean towards horror, if I had to guess. Uh, if you haven't seen this yet, I recommend you check it out and come back, because I'm going to be covering a lot of spoilers as I go through this. Um, the opening episode is titled The Void. And we start with a... Uh, a shot of a bison that has two arrows in it. And this bison's arrows are uh, made of wood and they also have feathers, which is not your modern design for an arrow. So I found that pretty interesting right off the bat. Um, also the color grading, the cinematography, and even the weather is really dark in the opening scene. So I think we're kind of hitting the nail on the head when we say that there's probably going to be a tilt towards horror in this show. And the first words that we hear about the Greek god Kronos and I found this really interesting because he's the god of time. And I think that's a subtle indication that there's going to be a... Time's going to be a large factor in this show. Um, it's also interesting because he's typically represented as a, either an old man or as a serpent with three heads. Uh, one's a lion, one's a bull, and one is a man. Um, in the first 15 seconds of the show, we see a bison, which is pretty close to a bull. Uh, we see a man, but... I'm curious what the lion's going to be. I feel like Josh Brolin's character could represent the lion. Um, maybe I'm reading too much into this, but we'll see how it plays out. Uh, the reference that he's in his statement mentions the earth and the sky. The gods of whom are actually the mother and father of Kronos. And I'll provide a little bit more details to the story he's referencing, just in case you would like some uh, illumination on what's happening. Um, first off, Kronos' siblings were three giants and a cyclops who were imprisoned. And Kronos was asked by his mother to kill his father. Um, and she gave him the scythe that they talk about in the in the episode. Um, he did so by castrating his father. And when he did that, the blood that poured out is actually the uh, origin story for Aphrodite. Because uh, when he was castrated, the blood bled into the sea. And uh, she was created. And there were a bunch of other children that were created by... Um, the blood that poured out of him. Um, and Kronos uh, was then named King of the Titans because his father was dead. And he married his sister Rhea. And they had children that you probably heard of. Uh, Zeus, Hades, and Poseidon are all the children of Kronos. So he's a pretty significant god. Um, if you guys want me to go deeper on all that, I'd be happy to. But for now, I'm just going to get back to the show. Uh, we cut to a shot with the F-150 either being pursued or followed by an ATV, and then back to Brolin running shirtless with the body now across his shoulders. Uh, we see that this body is wearing a shirt which is covered in dry blood, so whatever happened didn't happen immediately before the scene. Um, then he casts the body into some sort of abyss. Uh, there was no splashing when this happened, even though the logical explanation would be some type of water. He turns into struck by a bright light, and we cut. This light could easily be explained as belonging to one of the vehicles, but I'm reasonably sure he would have heard them approaching. Um, their sounds are pretty apparent, and in the cold, dark desert, anything like that is going to be very noticeable. Uh, his face isn't really one of fear, but more like he has some explaining to do, like he got caught with his pants down. Uh, Brolin states the world's been waiting for something like this, and then we cut to three days earlier. Brolin lies awake next to Lily, who mentions a recurring dream with an interesting statement about a Rebecca stepping out of the dark. We'll get to that in a little bit. Um, that seems like two references to a void in the first two minutes of the episode, so I think that's notable. Uh, we get the name of Brolin's character. It's Royal. 
Uh, he checks on the children, and we notice that one's missing, but later found sleeping on the floor in another child's room. This appears to be normal because Royal didn't seem too concerned. Um, and next we get a lingering shot on a family photo, one of whom's likely Rebecca. Royal rides off to check on his cattle and hears a low rumble like thunder with a sort of metallic sound to it, suggesting it's something else. And next we cut to the family cooking breakfast as Royal returns and discovered that he apparently lost track of time by two hours, which is unlikely due to poor judgment because this guy gets up at dawn and didn't even have an alarm clock. We cut to church where we see Royal did attend, but he didn't join the family and sits in the back not participating. It seems like he's kind of hurting and protecting his family kind of in the same way that he does his cattle. And it's also kind of a suggestion that, you know, his faith has been challenged if it exists at all. Um, following church, his grandma, granddaughter, sorry, shows him a painting that she made of what she thinks heaven looks like. And something stood out to me there. Uh, her family are all dressed the same. Um, there's some people in the background uh, that are running. It looks like they're running, at least by their posture. And they all are dressed differently than her family. And she even went to the, the extreme of painting or coloring the mountains different colors. So I think there's some significance to the fact that she chose to make the family all look the same other than the fact that they're all related. But that's just speculation. We'll see how that pans out. Uh, typically, family or children will dress their family in a way kind of representative of how they imagine them. So like if you're the kind of dad that has a business suit on all the time, the kid would probably draw you in a business suit. So I think it's definitely notable that she did that. Uh, the next scene's at a rodeo where Royal is cheering on his son, Rhett, who's a competitor. Uh, apparently, if he wins, he's going to move on to the next level, and he does, he, he falls. Um, the cow or bull that he was riding was extremely aggressive, so I don't think he had much of a chance to begin with. But nonetheless, he's not moving forward to the next level. Uh, we get a brief shot of a painting featuring a bison with two marks on its side. I think this might be a reference to the bison that we saw in the opening sequence. Uh, Lily's asked by her granddaughter to hear the story of how her and Royal met. And I think this is uh, some really relevant exposition for us viewers. Uh, writers try to avoid that sort of thing, but I think that this is really important and it was the best way to convey that information. We discover that something happened to Royal's mother and father and he had to run away and doesn't remember anything. Um, I don't know if he's willfully not remembering, if, if he doesn't want to talk about it, or if it's genuinely a, kind of a blocked out moment in his memory, similar to the two hours that he had earlier. I don't know. Sorry about that, guys. I normally do these in one take, but I got a phone call, so I had to put a little cut there. Anyways, Royal goes to check on the animals. Just as they're showing some distress, we hear another low rumble to the west. Uh, this direction is apparent because it's the same direction as the setting sun, so... Uh, we know that's where it is in relation to the ranch. And there's hundreds of fleeing birds coming from that direction as well. So it definitely kind of stirred everything up in that area. Then we cut to a large home in the same direction. Uh, and we see how retirements is going for Coach Yost from Remember the Titans. Apparently he did pretty well for himself. Um, he's watching out the window and looking to the west as well. And as he hears the sound, he slowly takes a drink and clutches what appears to be a geode. Uh, his character is extremely creepy. He gets up grunting and mumbling to a bison hanging on the wall, talking about how he can hear it. And we get another long, still look at the uh, geode on the table. I'm going to go ahead and assume that this is probably some type of meteorite or something because they don't really look that interesting in real life, but geodes do. Uh, but either way, it's something that they want us to look at. Uh, he then calls the abbots to warn them that something's coming, something's happening. Royal returns to his duties, and we discover that there's some missing cattle, and anyone who's seen Season 1 of South Park knows what's going on here. Uh, a woman played by Imogen Poots from Vivarium, a movie that I really like, uh, strolls up to the ranch on foot from Boulder, claiming that she's a poet looking for inspiration. And he directs her to the west side of the ranch, which is pretty interesting considering that's where the sound came from. I suspect she'll get a good bit of inspiration while she stays there. And then we see three men right off on ATVs, one of which I'm assuming is going to be the one in the opening scene. But we still haven't seen the F-150, and I have a feeling it might belong to the mysterious neighbor. They have a lot of money, and they seem kind of eccentric, so we'll see what happens. Uh, the men run up to meet the abbots and notify them that they're encroaching on their land and have 30 days to move their fences. Uh, calling it over the line seems pretty appropriate for Coach Yo, so that makes sense. Uh, they resume checking the fences and Royal opts for the west side. I suspect it's 
largely just curiosity from the sound, but it also probably has something to do with the fact that if one of his sons goes over there and sees that pretty woman, that they'll probably get distracted and probably won't be as attentive as they'd otherwise be. Uh, he notices the poet setting up camp, and just then he hears the rumbling sounds again. Now it sounds quite a bit closer, and it startles his horse. Uh, then he sees the culprit of the missing cattle, a large, perfectly circular hole in the ground, which is, I'm sure, the void from the opening scene. The dust floats in the hole, suggesting some type of gravitational disruption, or maybe it's just a disruption in space-time itself. Is it aliens? Ancient astronaut theorists say yes. Um... He does what any sane person would do and reaches into the void and experiences some kind of flashback or flash sideways, something from Lost Season 5, and regains his awareness, retracting his hand. When he does so, there's some sort of blackness that's fading away from his skin, which suggests, I don't know, it reminds me of Severance. Uh, and it's equally mysterious. Royal returns home to find a police officer in his driveway, and once he enters, he sees that what he was seeing was, in fact, the future, and I think he found that more disturbing than the police officer being at his house. The officers arrive to inform him that the search for Rebecca is being called off after nine months. Um, and Perry's really upset about it. And we discover that Rebecca was actually his wife. Um, apparently after nine months, they assume that the person probably just left to their own free will. And kind of wait on a body to show up, I guess. Um, they also cut to uh, the daughter praying for her mom to return home. Um, and then they cut to the void. So I'm assuming that uh, Rebecca stepping out of the darkness in the earlier scene was a reference to her coming out of the void. Um, I just want to note that Perry's played by Tom Pelfrey, who's a character in Ozark, and I really, really like that show, and I encourage you to check it out if you haven't seen it. Um, my video on that has, like, no views, so apparently I'm the only one that watches it, but excellent, excellent show. Uh, the next morning, rather than tending to the cattle right away, we see Royal return to the void to attempt to cover it up. He throws dirt in it, and later the entire shovel, just in frustration, he tries to cover it with the tarp, which doesn't work, and he just screams. Um, poor guy. Then we see the bison with the two arrows just appear next to him. Uh, the bison's clearly smarter than the cattle because it walks around the void. Royal then rides to visit with the poet and see if she's noticed anything strange, presenting it as a general welfare check. Um, and they have a very interesting dialogue about the ranch, about how there's something special there, and she's kind of probing to see if he would sell it, and offers to exchange secrets if Royal has any to offer. This suggests she knows a little bit more than she's letting on. Um, back at the house, Perry and Rhett decide to go out for a drink, and we get a nice throwback to Pulp Fiction. There's a country remix of the song from the dance competition in that movie, as well as uh, you see a couple dancing in the background, and I seriously doubt that was an accident. Meanwhile, Cecilia and Royal discuss Rebecca's unlikely return, and Cecilia seems concerned about how that situation may have affected Royal's faith in God. Uh, little does she know, what he found in the field probably has quite an impact on his faith as well, and of course he's reluctant to say anything about it. Perry and Rhett continue to get drunk, and the subject of Rebecca comes up, with Rhett promising to stick with bull riding if Perry will move past Rebecca. Uh, probably not a good move that stirs up some emotions. Uh, Perry then feels sick and steps outside to throw up. But when he does so, he does it on the wrong guy, one of the neighbor's kids. Um, he proceeds to pick a fight with them while Rhett's flirting with a woman at the bar from his childhood, who apparently has some kind of relationship with that guy as well. And Rhett notices in time to step out and knock the guy out before he does too much damage. So I guess that's a good thing. But next, uh, uh, we discover that at this moment... <laughs> I had to cut again there because A-L-E-X-A thought I said her name. Anyways, we discover uh, that Trevor's uh, dressed very similar to the body that Royal threw into the void. So I think what happens here is pretty much going to be predictable. We now have her means, motive, and opportunity boxes checked. Uh, Perry hits him with a classic throat punch and appears to beat the life out of him right in front of the, the bar. Rhett pulls the truck around and discovers what's happened since he left Trevor with his dick in the dirt a few moments earlier. And we cut to Autumn, the poet, who's sketching something in a notebook, most of which is covered by shadow, but it appears to be some kind of philosophy about life's experiences, and more interestingly, she's carefully drawn some circles that kind of look like crop circles, and I suggest they have some kind of connection to the, uh, the void. We return to Rhett and Perry riding in the truck with Trevor's uh, questionably alive body, and Rhett asks Perry what he wants him to do, take him to the hospital, take him straight to the sheriff, um... 
Perry looks to be in shock and they find themselves almost crashing into the same bison, the one with the two arrows from earlier that keeps popping up. The bison looks straight at Perry and grunts as if it knows exactly what's going on. And they opt to return to the ranch where Royal sits on the porch contemplating the day's events. The boys turn off the lights and try to sneak in the barn and decide their next move, but Royal watched them do it, so he steps in to investigate. Um, he goes in to discuss things, and uh, Royal holds the phone while working out how to solve the situation before making a call. After clarifying that nobody else knows what happens, he hangs it up and says, let's fix this. Royal says he can't allow Amy to lose both parents and instructs Rhett to dispose of the evidence while he handles the body himself. And after he returns, there will be no further discussion. Ain't that the truth? Um, we return to the bar to see Trevor's brothers begin to notice his absence and uh, discover a blood-soaked belt buckle in the dirt, leading them directly to the Abbott Ranch to investigate. Perry answers the door and tries to cover for Rhett, but they insist on knowing where he's at and try to come inside. As they continue to press Perry, he signals to Royal and Rhett in the barn by flicking the light switch, which I thought was pretty clever. At this point, I noticed there's an F-150 in the background, so now we have that. Things are starting to come together. They break into the barn and discover a lack of evidence other than the fresh horse manure and begin to unload the ATV. Royal heads to the void as quickly as he can, even catching his shirt in the fence when he tries to squeeze through and he left it behind and proceeds to dispose of the body. Trevor's body sinks slowly into the pit as if in water, but it eventually succumbs to the darkness. As Royal turns from the void, he's struck by a bright light, and we discover it's Autumn, the poet. She proceeds to ask him what's going on and suggests he must know something if he chose to throw a body down there. She then proceeds to talk about the god Kronos, and while her point is sound, her presentation is not entirely accurate, but we'll excuse that for now and let the character develop a little bit more. Um, she asks if anyone else knows what's going on and agrees to let it be their secret, stating the world had been waiting for something like this. The same quote from the opening scene. And she pushes him into the pit. Roll credits. Um, that was pretty intense. Uh, my takeaways, it was a well-written script. Uh, anything that mentions mythology in the first five minutes is going to have my attention, especially when it's somebody as influential as Kronos. Um, I'm hoping this isn't the last we've seen a royal, but it's hard to say at this point. Perhaps something different happens to someone thrown into the pit who's alive, but that said, we haven't seen the two missing cattle yet, so I don't know. Um, all the talk of Kronos and the flash forward earlier suggests that if he does come back, when might be a better question. Um, also, there hasn't been any evidence of extraterrestrials beyond the pit at this point, um, but I'm sure they're going to pop up. Uh, I have not seen the trailer, so I, I only watch trailers if it's something I'm trying to decide if I want to watch, and... After being asked to cover this, I was going to do it anyway, so I did a little bit of reading, and that's it. Um, I like to let things be a mystery and kind of let it play out as it takes place. Um, I think it's probably a gateway to space-time, um, but to where? I don't know. Uh, the shirt hanging on the fence I think will likely play a role in what's to come. Uh, I'm curious if it has Trevor's blood on it as well as Royal's, because that might be a big issue if it does. Um, but definitely a solid pilot, and I'm excited to see what comes next. I will be covering episode two as soon as I get a chance, and I hope you return to check out what I have to say about that. Um, I'm glad you made it to the end of the video, and thank you very much for watching. I hope you uh, like, share, and subscribe, and let me know what you think in the comments. You guys have a good night, and we'll see you soon.